Thank you, Tim, and thank you to the Law Review and uh, its editors and organizers. Thank you to Haim uh, for writing a book that has brought us all together. Um, I'm Michael Moreland. I teach at the law school here at Villanova, and I also direct the Eleanor McCullen Center for Law, Religion, and Public Policy. And one of the joys of being a director of a Center for Law and Religion at Villanova is having a colleague as generous and productive and engaged as Haim to bring uh, such a group together. So I'll briefly introduce our four speakers. They'll speak for, I've instructed them about 15 to 18 minutes each, uh, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end for questions and then recess for lunch. So I'll introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Haider Allah Hamoudi is Vice Dean and Professor of Law at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he is uh, where he teaches contracts, commercial law, uh, and Islamic law. He is a renowned scholar of Islamic law, particularly Islamic finance. A recent publication of his is Negotiating in Civil Conflict, Imperfect Bargaining and Constitutional Construction in Iraq, University of Chicago, 2013. Kevin Hughes uh, from Villanova here is Associate Professor of Theology and Religious Studies and Humanities. He is a scholar of medieval Christianity, particularly the thought of St. Bonaventure. And a uh, recent publication uh, is Paul Biblical Commentary and the Development of Doctrine in the Early Middle Ages, Catholic University Press. M. Kathleen Caveney is the Darrell and Juliet Libby Professor of Law and also appointed in the Department of Theology at Boston College. She focuses on the relationship of law, religion, and morality. Uh, recent, two recent publications are Ethics at the Edges of the Law, Christian Moralists and American Legal Thought, Oxford University Press, 2018, and Prophecy Without Contempt, Religious Discourse in the Public Square, Harvard University Press, 2016. And last but not least, uh, my friend Nathan Oman, who I think the last two times Nate and I were together, it was at Malibu and Pepperdine. So this is not quite as scenic or, or warm, but, uh, but we're glad to have him here. Uh, Nate is the Rollins Professor of Law and the Cabell Research Professor of Law, and also the co-director of the Center for the Study of Law and Markets at William & Mary. His interests are in contract law, economic analysis of law, jurisprudence, and legal history. Uh, he's the recent author of The Dignity of Commerce, Markets, and the Moral Foundations of Contract Law, University of Chicago Press, 2017. So welcome our panelists, and I'll turn it over to Heider. Thank you very much, and thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, thanks to uh, Hayam for uh, uh, considering me uh, to uh, uh, give this um, uh, uh, talk. Um, I really uh, enjoyed the book, and I enjoyed uh, uh, seeing so much, not knowing very much, uh, pr really almost anything in the, in the <coughs> Jewish law tradition, uh, seeing so many areas of resonance as between uh, Jewish law uh, and uh, uh, Islamic law. Uh, beginning with the name, the word sharia in Arabic also means the path, literally the path to the watering hole, which is, you know, in an arid environment is the most, uh, most important thing at all, of all, and the means by which law can be used uh, to serve functions other than trying to derive a legal rule, um, and hence, you know, sometimes the pursuit of the arcane uh, uh, is itself the pursuit of um, something else. One of Haim's most amusing examples is the guy who falls off the roof and accidentally impregnates uh, the woman. Um, we, we, we have an analogy, which is the man who has uh, sex with his wife, and then she has forbidden lesbian sex with a servant, and then the semen transfers through and impregnates, and so does the rules of paternity apply? Uh, they spend pages and pages talking about this. No one cares that so that's not how sex actually works. Uh, it's not important. Uh, what is important are the understanding of the nature of paternity and the nature of uh, fatherhood, the nature of the relationship of the husband to the wife as well, or, or, uh, uh, and the father to the mother. Um, and all of that is being explored uh, this way. There, it's not entirely analogous. I don't want to uh, uh, sound facile or reductive. Uh, clearly, Islamic law and some of the core questions of Islamic philosophy that obsess jurists uh, uh, throughout the medieval period, questions like uh, uh, the role of reason in Islamic jurisprudence, whether one could know the good and the bad as irrespective of re revelation through rationality alone, the related question of whether the Quran was an attribute of God or a sign of God. All of these questions uh, were um, uh, uh, were uh, or a creation of God. Uh, uh, all these questions were were, were were attached much more directly and not through legal questions. Uh, but anyway, I saw so much that was was similar, or so much. Let me just say that resonated rather than say similar um, uh, within within the Islamic tradition um, uh, and the uh, and the. Uh, um, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, the Jewish one. Um, and the idea uh, of, is particularly salient in the context of Shiism. Shiism uh, posits that following the death of the Prophet Muhammad, you have 12 imams, male lineal descendants of the Prophet. They are infallible. They know everything. The 12th when, I mean, not know everything, but they, 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 uh, they, they, they're infallible, they, they won't make error. The twelfth went into hiding, remains in hiding to this day, and we live in what's known as the ghaybah, right? which, I mean, again, without trying to be too facile, doesn't sound terribly different. One is imagining a messianic future in which uh, perfection can be reestablished. The state is almost a hostile entity during this entire time. The law is meant to resist the state, right? It is not part of the state. It's meant to resist the state. It's sort of standing in opposition to the state. Even within the Sunni world where that's not, that kind of resistance isn't there, the idea of the law as being independent of the state, the idea of the Sunni jurist is toiling within the books and separate from the state, right? Sometimes being asked to be a judge and not wanting wanting to sully themselves with the state uh, 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 also uh, is reflected in the, um, uh, uh, in the jurisprudence. And that does create fundamentally what I wanted to talk about, which is the, the similar tensions that Hayam gets to at the end of his book um, as between modern state law uh, and Islamic law. Right? And, and one, one, one can certainly see some of them and some can, can see some residents in some of the descriptions that Hayam has. Uh, for example, the idea that because it's not just purely a legal system but it's one that's infused with morality and ethics, that we categorize acts not purely as permitted or not permitted, but in fact as obligatory, recommended, God's neutral on this one, reprehensible, and then forbidden. Right? And those don't parlay themselves that well into state law. Right? And when they do, distortions tend to occur. One of the most famous statements of the Prophet Muhammad is, of all the things <coughs> permitted to husbands, or all the things permitted to men, right? of the most reprehensible, detestable, in the eyes of God is divorce. Right? Well, in state law, that can be translated into one word, permissible. And yet that's not really what the system is trying to get at. Now, the fact that you have state law then sort of does create that kind of distortion, which actually does then affect the ethics of it. Oh, I can do it. I can do it, right? I can do it. Just go to the courthouse. I'm done. Um, uh, uh, but it does create that sort of tension with modern, uh, modern state law. The embrace of pluralism. The pluralism is even more pronounced than Islamic law. There are separate schools, right? So it's not just uh, that uh, they sort of debate different points and then sort of come out with an answer even one latent with ambiguity, but very often it'll be, they'll debate the thing forever, and then it'll be, and then Madik says this, Shafi'i says this, Ahmed says this, and we, the Hanafis, or whoever, say this, right? This is our conclusion. There's no finality to it at all, right? This is our opinion, and it always closes with the same two words, and God knows best, which is two words in Arabic. God knows us, who knows, right? Uh, that sort of thing doesn't work. And it's easy to say, and there's a lot of modern sloppy code codifiers said, we'll just pick one, it doesn't really matter. Any one of the four is fine, right? That creates distortions of its own, right? The Malikis, Islamic law does permit a woman to uh, dissolve, the, uh, the, a judge has the power to dissolve a, a marriage between a husband and a wife over the objections of the husband. Uh, uh, in Islamic law, but there has to be cause, right? The Malikis would say, well, the failure of the husband to support his wife is a cause. The Hanafis would say, no, no, it's not a cause, right? But she has the right to attach the home, she has the right to attach his assets, she has the right to garnish his wages, she could do all sorts of stuff, right? You'd be surprised at the number of codes that say, well, a wife cannot right, seek a dissolution from her husband because he's not supporting her. We'll take the Hanafi position. Uh, she also can't garnish his wages, that's the Maliki position. See, we're picking. Right? Well, okay, but you picked them in a way that completely <coughs> eviscerated right, one, of the, one, one of the fundamental sort of understandings of what the marital contract is, right? So it doesn't really work uh, to do that. The absence of public law theory, right? Kayyem had called it uh, sort of administrative law and the, and the fact that there's no, um, you know, that you have sort of uh, a, a limited administrative law. There's no real conception of the state. Again, with Shiism, this is particularly pronounced. It, it's almost, it's not there entirely, right? The state is an epiphenomenon from which the believer is alienated, right? Under, it's, it's almost an eschatological necessity until the, until the, uh, until the, until the Mahdi comes back, right? Because it's illegitimate. It's not led by the infallible leader, right? Forget about the state. Who cares, 
Now, with the Sunnism, again, it's not that pronounced. They do think about the caliph and what is his relationship to Islamic law, and he really should be bound by Islamic law. But public law, by which I mean administrative and institutional rules that say, all right, well, here's how we know if the caliph exceeded it. Here's who gets to decide. Here's how you stop them. Here's what you do to do this and that. All of that is missing within uh, within the um, uh, 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 within the uh, 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 the pre-modern tradition, right, and 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 would have to be supplanted um, uh, 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 elsewhere. One thing that uh, Haim doesn't talk about as much in the Jewish tradition, and I would be interested in hearing. And and, and when Rabbi Weider was was speaking, it was it was particularly uh, interesting to me because uh, because I, because I was uh, 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 sort of reflecting on this, and that's the role of authority. Right? We know who the authorities are in the state. There's a certain formalized process by which one is handed a particular license, gets a particular title. I know how the judge is because there's a rule of recognition by which a judge is conferred. That isn't really the case within the Islamic tradition. At the same time, authority is really important because one of the consequences of saying everybody should study the law, it's really a good thing to study the law, is the concern well, from the point of view of those within the hierarchy and on top of it in particular, the concern is an exegetical and hermeneutical <coughs> free-for-all for everybody comes in and says, well, you know, especially in modernity, everything's available online. I picked it up. Here's the answer, right? And so authority becomes particularly important. And the Shia jurists in particular, who actually have managed to retain their authority in modernity in a way the Sunni jurists have not, all the juristic manuals start the first part, Kitab al-Ijtihad, the book of juristic effort. Everybody should try to become a jurist. Everybody should study Islamic law. We know everybody can't. So if you can't, you're not a jurist. You're a follower. Find a jurist and listen to what they say. Right? <laughs> I've summarized it. I mean, it's longer than that. But that's pretty much where it goes. right? Because authority becomes important. Now, how do you know the jurist? Well, it's a much more informalized process. right? You're not relying on state mechanisms. You're not relying on licenses. It's not that pre-modern societies, Sunni ones in particular, didn't have titles. You know, Chief Mufti, particularly the Ottomans. But the really prominent jurists usually weren't that closely associated with the state. Right? And certainly, the, the definition of who was the <coughs> most knowledgeable and who was the most respected was determined much more by the internal schools themselves right, than by any state process. In the same way that if you were to say who are the five best scholars of constitutional law, right? there's no state process. Everybody knows. I mean, not everybody knows. I mean, people argue about it. But I mean, everybody will cir cir uh, circle around the same sort of set of names. Right? Uh, and it's got nothing to do with what the state says. In fact, what the state says is almost completely irrelevant. Uh, if anything, potentially sullying. Right? Um, uh, so anyway, you have uh, authority. The final, the final one that I <coughs> wanted to talk about, and this is really more Shi'i than it is anything else, but again, the, the parallels of the resonance was so strong, I, th I thought it was important to bring out Shi'ism. The idea of precaution. Uh, Hayam mentions it once in the context of the morning prayer. You know, as a precaution, you should do this. One of the features of being in the veiba, being in the uncertainty of waiting for the Mehdi to come back is doubt is not a bug of the jurisprudence, it's a feature of the jurisprudence. We can't know everything with the absence of the infallible imam. It has to be that there's an absence, right? And so when we don't know, well, we say as a precaution, do this, right? As a precaution, do that. If you're not sure whether or not you're supposed to support your spouse, as a precaution, because of whatever, you're better off doing it. It's not bad to give money to somebody. It's bad not to if you're supposed to. Again, that doesn't work well when you think about it as against state law. No one does their taxes that way. Right? You do it the opposite way. Do I have an argument not to pay this? Yes, I'm not paying it. And there's a certain danger, I should say, right, with uh, sort of the, the Iranian model uh, uh, when, when, when uh, uh, the attempt was to sort of make Shia Islamic law into the law of the state to use precaution to sort of create a great deal of state creed, right? And almost reserve, reverse the presumption of, if it's not illegal, I'm supposed to be able to do it, right? To, as a precaution, it was gray. Maybe you need some time in jail. So, uh, uh, so uh, 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 we do have that. So where do we go, given these tensions? And here, I think there's some departure from the kind of examples that Haim was offering in the 
uh, uh, Jewish context. Let me just sort of make some observations about Islamic law uh, in modernity. Uh, one is that uh, one of the obvious options is to say, well, who cares? Just forget it. Let's just move into a secular sort of state. And, 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 and uh, uh, there is, I don't want to say that there is no constituency for that. There is in Turkey, in Tunisia. There are certainly strong secular elements throughout Islamic society. I would say that all, if the polls are to be believed and the, and the, and the, uh, um, uh, 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 the data is to be believed, uh, there's at least a substantial number of Islamic societies where that's not really an option. Overwhelmingly, people want Islamic law uh, to be part of, 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 of the law. Um, they might not know what that means in large numbers of cases, right? Uh, but, but the fact that they do means that sort of just shunting it off to the side is not really, uh, 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 not really uh, uh, doable. The second issue, and uh, uh, it sort of relates to what Hayam called a constitutional moment, um, you have a massive diffusion of Islamic law across a bunch of different nation states and a wide variety of Muslims speaking different languages and coming up in different national legal traditions um, with different scholars thinking different things. It becomes very challenging in that particular context, I think, to imagine everyone coming together right, and agreeing on something. They can't even, we can't even ever agree on when our holidays are. We saw the moon, we didn't see the moon, it's tomorrow, it's today. Um, uh, 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 uh. And the third thing is just the uh, sort of the anti-colonial, post-colonial sort of fervor that continues to sort of infect the region, such that any sort of attempt to reform might be dismissed as <coughs> imperialist, colonialist, Western in ways that are meant to delegitimize the project. And I think those create those kinds of difficulties. Um, uh, 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 so uh, it's not that we haven't had attempts for the state to sort of figure out a way to think of Islamic law anew. Perhaps one of the most successful is the Sinhuri civil codes that were done in the mid 20th century, where Sinhuri sort of said, I'm going to look at Sunni juristic theory across the ages, and I'm going to do, get some principles out of that, right? And from these rules, we'll draw these bar order principles, right? Notice, again, parallels. From the specific rules, I can look at parallel, the principles from those principles, and I will draft a code that is consonant with Islamic law principles, not the specific rules, that's too, but the principles, and uh, um, uh, uh, make it work. It ends up looking a lot like a modern civil code, like the French civil code, but at the same time, it is a justificatory project. So there were some efforts at that. I would say that those, you know, those have come up under more difficulty later, although we have Islamic constitutionalism, which attempts some, some of this as well. Um, I will say that a lot of the, areas in which Islamic law has permeated more deeply or more broadly within the modern Muslim fabric have been places in which the state isn't as preeminent. That is to say, you can almost think of it as bottom up. The two examples I would give are legal pluralism, the extent to which when the state absents itself right, and allows uh, different communities to operate things, you can have, uh, you can have uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a little more of a nascent uh, 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 Islamic law sense to things. And Islamic finance, right? Whether or not one can be, one can be quite critical of Islamic finance, I have been in the past. Uh, at the same time, it's hard to, de to deny its effectiveness and its expanse into a, you know, a several trillion dollar industry. What's not commonly known about Islamic finance it's not really a matter of state regulation. Very few states ban interest, including Malaysia. And the three major centers are Kuala Lumpur, which doesn't ban interest, the Gulf Cooperation Council, which some countries do, and then the third is London, which obviously doesn't have a problem with interest. But the ways in which uh, uh, one can structure these transactions and to try to do it, and different, different scholars approve different types of transactions, and there's different competition, and there's coherence, right? There's coherence. You can't just go off on your own and say, well, you know, who said it was such a bad thing? But that coherence, right? Um, uh, um, uh, uh, so believe it or not, I actually was done. So that thing. <laughs> uh, but I did want to. I, I did want to thank uh, Hayam in closing and just saying that uh, you know this opportunity to really, really read about a different uh, legal tradition with so much resonance really gave me the opportunity to think about the tradition in which I've studied so much uh, 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 in new ways. And so, and so, uh, it really was a great, great, great opportunity. So thanks once again. I think I'll try it without the mic. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to beg your your uh, your your forgiveness for right away because uh, as you can hear, my voice is uh, 
Um, I'm recovering from illness, so I hope you'll be able to hear me. I tend to, I never have this problem in any other time, and so hopefully I'll be able to work through that. But I'm so grateful to be here. I'm grateful to Chaim for such a great book. Uh, I'm grateful for our uh, collegial friendship over these, over these years. Um, grateful to the Shikoyas and uh, to Villanova Law School, and it's good to be here. Um, well, as a participant in a Christian-Jewish dialogue, uh, both formal and informal, for many years, one of the common truisms that I often encounter that serves as a point of departure goes something like this, that Christianity is concerned with belief, and so with doctrine and with creed, whereas Judaism is concerned with mitzvah, with God's call to action, as Chaim says. Um, some Jews have said to me, for, for Jews it doesn't really matter what one believes at all. Now whether that's fair or not, Chaim says the Talmud offers a profoundly different way of thinking, and that's right. Its starting point is the mitzvah, God's call to action, and its core intellectual tool is interpretation, be it of the Bible, the Mishnah, or its own early material, end quote. As a Christian theologian, I've always wondered about the implications of this starker form of this basic contrast. In a post-Kantian, late modern world, this characterization of Judaism as fundamentally ethical and not metaphysical seems to lend itself too easily to a kind of secularity that, while claiming the kind of open agnosticism with respect to God, in effect dismisses the question of God altogether. In a similar way, from a philosophical point of view, it becomes quite difficult to think about how one should act without a sense of the whole that one would have to call metaphysical, whether the metaphysics is implicit or explicit. That is, the only way one can decide what is good for a human being to do as if you have some significant sense of what a human being is, and therefore what the human good is. And to consider the human good is implicitly or explicitly, to consider how humans fit within the larger world in which they live, etc., etc. So from my perspective, and at least this limited and attenuated sense, action is impossible without metaphysical judgment. <coughs> so with that in mind, one of the significant benefits of Chaim's book, and we've heard about it already, is the clear demonstration in multiple places throughout that halakhic discussion of the Talmud is not the refusal or the dismissal of fundamental philosophical and theological questions of, for example, the nature of humanity, of how we measure the human essence, as Chaim phrases it. Instead, halakha offers a radically different angle of approach to these sorts of questions. As Chaim says, quote, what is beauty? What is truth? What is the best political ordering? The Talmud anchors, anchors such macro questions in the context of the specific mitzvah and its obligations. In brief, he continues, what the Greeks pursued through reflective and speculative philosophy, the rabbis read into, out of, and through Chalaka. To be clear, here we still have a clear difference in approach, but Chaim's detailed discussion of Chalaka brings a better understanding of the differences into focus. So, in an effort to clarify these differences even further, let me take a moment to reflect upon Chaim's characterization of the Western theological tradition, because I'm convinced that the re-engagement of Western Christian thinkers with the Jewish tradition of Talmud Torah has helped to bring to light tensions within that very Christian, Western Christian tradition that have lain, lain dormant. Uh, to illustrate his contrast, Chaim says, the Western tradition values structure and systematic thinking, its model for communicating ideas is the single individual positing a thesis supported by argument that flow from premise to claim to conclusion. Kahn notes that the pre-rabbinic uh, Jewish writers such as Philo and Josephus reflect this, but quote, we heard this earlier, none of these characteristics are true of the Mishnah, Tosefta, Babylonian Talmud, Jerusalem Talmud, Midrash Halakha, Midrash Agada, or any classical text of Jewish uh, law or thought. Okay. It's hard to argue with Kaim's characterization of Western thinking, at least as we encounter it today. But I want to suggest that this characterization reflects a specifically modern sensibility, maybe more Descartes than Plato, maybe more Descartes than Aristotle. Um, and the elevation of structure and systematic thinking in this way is not quite characteristic of Western or Greek thought as such, but of a narrowed and constrained modern Western rationality that has managed skillfully to misremember its own past, and so to forget some modes of thinking that have been, and perhaps still ought to be, part of the Western tradition. And here, as you can hear, I'm registering a point of uh, 
disagreement or at least qualification to Christine Hayes' claim earlier. Maybe we can talk about that. That is the contrast that Chaim rightly sees between rabbinic halakhic rationality and Western reasoning highlights a tension that has been present within Western rationality itself. And the dimensions of Western reasoning, at least in philosophy and theology, that bore the greatest kinship to halakhic reasoning that Chaim so ably describes, have been eclipsed, forgotten, or dismissed, or misremembered. Example, in the early Middle Ages, after the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, Christian education moved in and through the network of monasteries established through the empire's ruins. This is sort of a truism, right? In what was characterized once as the Dark Ages, this monastic form of learning was snickered at later by the self-proclaimed enlightenment as mere transmission. The image of the monastic copy room is still lodged somewhere in our, all of our popular imaginary, social imaginary as the sort of model of medieval intellectual life, sort of blindly passing on what they themselves perhaps did not understand. Those of you who are of a certain age will remember that, that you know, they made Xerox commercials you know, based on <laughs> what monks used to do and now Xerox does. Um, <laughs> Right. But beginning from the mid-20th century, medievalists such as Jean Leclerc and many others began to transform our understanding of the early medieval religious intellect. Monastic education focused upon scriptural interpretation, and it did focus on gathering and arranging and copying sources. From Augustine and Ambrose, Jerome, Athanasius, all of these figures around, say, particular passages of scripture. But this practice was far more than cataloging. Instead, early medieval scholars engaged in the textual practice of reading, reception, argumentation across a long tradition that looks and whose logic works like, very much like, the Talmud. Opinions are offset, arranged in such a way that they converse with one another in the text over the scriptures. The student of these glossed texts learns to do theology not by learning propositions, but by entering into the conversation. So what Stephen Fraud said of the Midrash Sifra applies in this kind, of, uh, um, this kind of study of the Christian Bible. Here's Fraud on the Sifra. This collective nature of the Sifra's commentary gives the impression not of a single commentator standing face to face with the text of scripture in an unmediated work of interpretation, as if such were possible, but of a collector and subtle shaper of received traditions who creates a commentary out of such traditions by configuring them not only in relation to the atomized text of Deut Deuteronomy, but also in relation to one another. This is the dialectic of continuity of innovation that characterizes the stance of socio-historically grounded traditionality, the multivocality of a received yet restless tradition. That's the end quote, long quote. So it's this restless traditionality that Fraud sees in the Midrash Sifra that, that characterized the practice of Christian theology from the early Middle Ages up until the middle of the 12th century. With the birth of the University of Paris and the systemization and professionalization of theology in the scholastic period, this earlier mode of theological reflection was less equipped for an era increasingly concerned with scientific precision and definition and, I think this is related, anxious about religious conformity and consolidation of authority. And, also, it was harder to teach, as it required more apprenticeship than instruction. And this was a world in which pastoral need demanded a high turnover. You had to educate a lot of people quickly and get them out there into the field. But so much was lost in transition. My friend, uh, Rabbi Michael Signer, may his memory be a blessing, one of the great scholars of 12th century Jewish and Christian biblical interpretation, could barely say the name of Peter Lombard, one of the first great scholastic theologians, without a hiss, because for Michael, the scholastic shift signaled the end of a great theological conversation among medieval Christians and Jews due to this fundamental affinity of method. And this method, so... If it's not legal, it's narrative. I'll say more about that. So part of the gift of Chaim's book to me as a Christian theologian is in the way it encourages my own tradition toward recovery. The recovery, the re remembering of this affinity for explicit tradition forms of discourse, study, education, and formation. Of theological reading within a multivocal, received yet restless tradition. 
that can enter into better conversations with Jewish religious thinkers beyond the reductions of two simple contrasts. <coughs> Having said that, I do need to acknowledge that this is only part of the gift that the book has given to me, and another part has to do with the clearer articulation of the real differences that persist in the midst of this recovering affinity. The heart of these differences is this. Kalaka is not just about traditioned thinking, but it's most especially about the tradition of, as Chaim says, thinking legally. That is, Chaim demonstrates, as I have pointed out above, that Halakha gets at philosophical and theological questions differently from the specific root of the mitzvot, and this is a dimension of rabbinic thought that finds fewer and thinner Christian parallels. Christians do not naturally think legally. Not that Christians don't think about law, or the Christian lawyers don't think legally, but rather when Christians are doing the intellectual activity that is in part at least constitutive of their identity as Christians, when they are doing, in a word, in a phrase, faith-seeking understanding, in Anselm's famous phrase, they do not do it by thinking legally, at least in the first instance. Christians at root think narratively. It's easy to trace this back to Jesus himself. As Chaim notes, Jesus scoffed at the Pharisees' legal obsessions, arguing that their edifice of technicalities inevitably distracts the believer from the weightier matters of the law, whereas from the rabbinic perspective, these same technicalities are the prism through which weightier matters obtain religious significance. End quote. And certainly, St. Paul's greatest sense, great sense of liberation from the law, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life, establishes one of the master tropes of Christian discourse. But these initial points of departure are then confirmed and extended during the spread and establishment of Christianity. So the early text of the, the Epistle to Diognetus, dating somewhere between 150 and 190, contains a snapshot of Christian self-understanding in relation to law and identity, even before the Constantinian establishment, that points to this deepening different sensibility of what it meant to inhabit one's religious identity within an empire of alien gods. Here's this long quote from Diognetus. For Christians are not distinguished from the rest of humankind, either in locality or in speech or in customs. They do not dwell somewhere in cities of their own, neither do they use some different language, nor practice an extraordinary kind of life. But while they dwell in cities of Greeks and barbarians, as the lot of each is cast, and follow the native customs and dress and food and the other arrangements of life, yet the constitution of their own citizenship, which they set forth, is marvelous and confessedly contradicts expectation. They dwell in their own countries, but only as sojourners. They bear their share in all things as citizens, and they endure all hardships as strangers. Every foreign country is a fatherland to them, and every fatherland a foreign country. Their existence is on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the established laws and they surpass the law in their own lives. That's end quote. As the last line suggests especially, the dialectical sense of Christian identity entails a different attitude toward law, which here is local and contingent. Their citizenship is in heaven. The gradual establishment of Christianity, first as permissible and then as eventually as official, makes it easy and indeed necessary for Christian bishops who are serving as judges and other Christian judges to take up and make use of the well-established Roman law tradition in practical and civic matters, such that no particular Christian tradition of law needed to develop in an integral way within the life and practice of Christian faith. The later tradition of canon law would seem to, to change that perspective or would seem to alter that. But even there, we see very clearly a division between theology and law. The great founding figure in the Western canon law tradition, uh, Gratian, compiled and edited his Decretum in the 12th century. And our intellectual historians recognize in it a new kind of synthesis. So very often, you know, when people are excited about Gratian, they say, you know, Gratian brought theology to law and law to theology. And this is true insofar as it goes, because Gratian does draw upon theological resources in the Decretum. But the number of times you'll actually run into Gratian in a theological source, almost never. Nobody doing or learning 
training in theology is reading canon law. <coughs> they're different activities, right? Or they're not including canon law within their, seldom including canon law within their discussion. The medieval school legend that Gratian and Peter Lombard, these early scholastic system writers, were brothers, conjures it up, up an image, I think, both of close kinship, but also of rivalry. It's not the same person. These are brothers, and you know how brothers can be. Um, all this is to say that it becomes impossible to conceive in Western Christian discourse and practice from very early on a single locus that could serve, as Chaim tells us, Chalakha does, quote, concurrently a system of governing rules and practices, a form of legal analysis, a platform of religious expression, and an object of devotional study. It's not simply possible in Christian discourse to put that all in one place. In our present era, haunted as we are, I think, by the fragmentation and specialization of many of our own discourses, and so by the increasing difficulty in communicating across boundaries, and at a time when Christian theology and spirituality hungers for a kind of holistic integration, that brings both temptations that both conservatives and liberals are prone to, I think, the integration how. The presence of this pliable, integrative space of halakha created by the discipline of generations of study can be something of an object of envy for Christians. One last moment of possible convergence, however. I was struck in my first reading of the book by Chaim's reading uh, discussion in the early pages of Galut, of the theological condition of exile in the wake of the destruction of the temple as the fundamental context for the development of Chalakha. This absence of a homeland in which to enact or enforce law, and yet the persistent attention to every piece of non-applied law, is for Chaim an indication that Chalakha is not only about regulation, but about expression, as creating a, a, we of interrelated, a web of interrelated concepts or extended metaphors that communicate social and religious meaning. And as I read this, I wondered what exactly this expression was of, I mean specifically. What were the social and religious meanings that such practices create? And I wonder, in light of that, at least analogically, speaking as a Christian theologian, these, this might be described as eschatological. In Christian theology, eschatology is understood to be fundamentally about the dialectical relationship between the already and the not yet. Again, for Christians, the sense is that the already of the kingdom is present in, in the coming of Christ and in the church, but the not yet is the awaiting of its final completion in the end of days. For Christians, this is felt palpably in the liturgy, but not only there. That our practice in the here and now is a partial performative participation in and anticipation of the fullness of the kingdom of God to come. And as I say, in common Christian discourse, this is considered distinctively Christian because, after all, Christians are those who believe that the Messiah has already come and will come again. And yet, too often and for too long, Christians have lost any real sense of, at least by analogy, Galut. Right? Christians have all too often felt entirely too comfortable in the world of the now. So to, to end with a question, is it fair to say, in this condition of exile, the study of law, even in the sort of detail that could never be put into practice in the here and now, is a kind of eschatological intellectual participation, and already and not yet, of when God's kingdom will come, when God's law in all its fullness will govern and be studied. And so, in this way, um, in this way, study of Alakah becomes an act not just of devotion or expression of meaning, but, and then you say this at one point, a mystical encounter with the presence of God, coming into the presence of God, and of the longing of the hope for its fullness at one and the same time. I hope so, but I hope so for Christian theology as well. Thank you all. Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to participate in this conference, and especially thanks to Haim for writing this book. He's not only a wonderful writer, but in fact, he's a wonderful teacher. I opened the book knowing very little about Halakha, and I unfortunately, given everything I've heard this morning, still 
Objectively speaking, know very little, but I have gained three pieces of wisdom that will help me proceed. First, I've got a framework that allows me to continue learning. I love your bibliography at the end. You know, we, we lawyers love our footnotes and our bibliographies. <coughs> and second, I have a sense not only of the letter of Halakha, but also of its reach and spirit. And this quote was particularly uh, important to me. Halakha is not primarily about regulating the social sphere. Not, he notice he didn't say not only, not primarily. Um, about regulating the social sphere, but a system of divinely ordained concepts that undergirds the spiritual, even physical universe. Torah study is not about crafting law to govern society, but the founding act of Jewishness that strives to master God's wisdom. Wow. It's uh, quite a, a, an enormous claim and enormous proposition to deal with. I also have a desire to learn more, a sense of the questions I want to ask and the issues that I would like to pursue given my own commitments, which are in some ways analogous to Heim's. Like Heim, I'm a secular lawyer. I'm also a Christian theological ethicist, but I am not, for reasons we just heard about, a canon lawyer. People think that if you're a lawyer and a theologian, you're a canon lawyer and you can tell them how to get an annulment. Cannot do <laughs> As I read the book, Halakha has significance not only or even primarily for a dialogue with canon law, which does aim primarily to regulate behavior in the community of the Catholic Church, but with moral theology, which asks basic questions about human action, character, and community, and systematic theology, which asks fundamental questions about the nature of God and of humanity's relationship with God. So bringing the con book into conversation with Christian thought, my task in these comments is an enormous challenge. How to go about addressing the challenge? Well, I thought one way to think about it would be, how would you construct a syllabus? What would be some of the questions you would raise um, in a course? Because Haim is such a good teacher, and because I myself am thinking about teaching more deliberately now, having just returned from a semester's leave, I began to ponder how I would construct a course in comparative theology and law using Christian sources and Haim's book and looking at some of the questions that are raised. So in my remarks today, I would like to point to three areas I would like to see on such a syllabus. This would, of course, be, unfortunately, a graduate course, since I'm pointing to areas that raise as many questions for me, and areas where I need to learn as much as I teach, and, uh, and questions that I would like to ask Heim, but uh, not an undergraduate course, because we all know we can't do that with undergrads, because they get mad at us. Someday, maybe, in the eschatological <laughs> future. <laughs> now, my questions I'd like to admit from the beginning may not have answers and your response to me may be a type of Wittgensteinian therapy. What you need to do is suppress the questions. You're asking the wrong questions. These are not questions that are raised um, within this framework. So if that's the case, then, th then tell me. Um, but I still have the questions, so I have to express them before they can be uh, Wittgensteinianized <coughs> away. First question is, how does God relate to the law? Um, Chaim explicates two views of halakha. The f we've heard much about them. I'm framing them as the functionalist view, which treats halakha more or less as a defined body of precepts that regulate action and behavior within the community. And the devotionalist view, which incorporates not only law narrowly construed, but a broader variety of literature, including stories and commentaries. And what I was very appreciative of the, um, of the comments this morning by Tamara and Christine was saying, well, maybe Maybe this is not a sharp dichotomy. Maybe this is like the Mandelbrot equation, a fractile equation. Maybe these are held together in every moment. And, and, and I, I actually like that for reasons that will come up um, in a second. Um, but I'll focus on the second view for a minute. It correlates with a high view, the <coughs> second view, of Torah's meaning and function. 
Quote, for the rabbis, Torah is God's wisdom and thus the locus of intellectual and spiritual attention. This is captured in the famous statement about Torah, turn it and turn it for all is in it. Since God is the creator of the universe and the Torah is God's direct communication with man, perhaps much, perhaps all of what man needs to know is found within it. So if I take that view of Torah and try to bring it into contact with Christianity, where am I going to look? Not to canon law, not to moral theology, I'm actually going to look to a subset of, of systematic theology called Christology, the doctrine of who Jesus Christ is. When Christians talk about being Christian, it's about Jesus Christ. Um, but that's a very, very complicated topic, um, especially in the era of the early church, because very early on, uh, Christian thinkers uh, brought together the idea of the logos that we find in Philemon in the early church with the particular person, the particular man, Jesus of Nazareth. And so Orthodox Christology, which is found in our basic creeds, the Apostle Creed uh, and the uh, Nicene Creed, brings them together. And you can see it sort of encapsulated in the beginning of the Gospel of John, which reads as follows. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. So, where Christianity addresses the question that Christine Hayes and Tamara was bringing up, how do you bring together the universal and the particular, is right there, right at the beginning, in the Christology, in the combination of this particular human being and, uh, and the Logos. And if you look at certain heresies, um, one of the things early Christianity had to work out was to ho hold these two things together. So you've got the heresy of docetism, which said, well, he only looked human, but he was really just the Logos, but kind of in man clothes. And then the her heresy of Arianism, which said, well, he was really um, you know, divine. Or I actually probably got them reversed. But the two heresies, which basically say he's not really human on the one hand, he's not really divine on the other. And those were very much uh, important in the early church. So what does this mean? I think it means that in certain well-defined and important respects, some of the claims that the Jewish tradition makes about the Torah and halakha broadly construed would be analogous, in fact, to the claims that Christianity makes about Jesus Christ. The word of God, the entire order of the universe, is intimately bound to one particular <coughs> human being who, according to the Christian creed, is the man Jesus of Nazareth. Now, this has enormous effects on the way we carry on the tradition. So the word, Jesus Christ, relativizes and interprets the words, the actual written scripture. The written words of scripture, the words of the tradition, are always, in a sense, normed by the living person of Jesus Christ. Because Christians believe that Jesus rose from the dead and sent his spirit after he ascended into heaven kind of complicated to explain, but just in some sense, the, the, the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ is still with the community now, and that's a reason, that, that's a source for interpretation. What does that mean? One, critique, development, and revision are possible. First, <coughs> about how to read scripture. Knowledge from the world which is rooted in the creation story, which is rooted in the logos, is actually a source of reading knowledge and revision about uh, how to read scripture. So one famous passage is from St. Augustine, De Genesi Ad Literum, on the literal meaning of Genesis, where he said, but someone may ask, is not scripture opposed to those who hold that heaven is spherical? When it says, who stretches out heaven like a skin? Let it be opposed if their statement is false. The truth is rather in what God reveals than in what human weakness surmises. 
But if they are able to establish their doctrines with proofs that cannot be denied, we must show that this statement of scripture about the skin is not opposed to the truth of their conclusions. So what you learn from astronomy, what you learn from geology, what you learn from the natural sciences has to be read as part of God's revelation. And how you read scripture in the Christian tradition has to be seen <coughs> in some sense consistent with it. Sometimes that will mean reading it in a metaphorical rather than a literal way. So it's always interesting to bring Augustine's commentary on Genesis into conversation with, say, some, some Protestant fundamentalists who have a very flat literal meaning of scripture. Second, this idea of Jesus and the logos and the particularity and the generality allows for the possibility of development of doctrine. And here I'm paying, I'm paying homage to the judge I clerk for John Noonan, who was a, uh, a very famous uh, uh, canonist, theologian, historian, and federal judge, who's done a lot of work on the development of doctrine on usury, say religious liberty, the death penalty, um, he would argue contraception, church doesn't quite agree with him yet. Um, and it, he basically said, this is something that comes about, how do you know when a development's true or not? Well, it's appeal to kind of the living person of, of Christ and the norms of Christ as seen in his, not just his teaching, but his actions in the gospel. So how would that raise questions for Heim? Questions I would like to talk to you about over a drink. How, if at all, can it be said that halakha develops as opposed to shifts and changes? Is there a teleological notion to this? Is development a theological or a legal concept within the system? Does the framework, do the rabbis see it as possible to gain greater insight into God's requirements or simply different insights? Do new insights about the natural world affect that development? And if so, how? So that's one set of questions on the first section of the class. Uh, um, how, do we, how does God relate to the law? Second section of the class, I think, would have to be on epistemology of law. How do we know the law, and who knows the law? God commands the study of Torah, as I understand it, to Jewish men. Do the rabbis reflect on either the manner in which human beings are fit to commune with God in this manner? And, and would it be possible for people other than <coughs> Jewish men, say Jewish women or Gentile men and women, to study Torah and say something true, something that the rabbis themselves would recognize as true as a result of their study? If so, would it, would be, would it be because God is enlightening them because of their skills and training in textual interpretation, or both? If so, why? If not, why not? More generally, what do human beings, as human beings, know about God's law? And why and how? In the, in the rabbinic tradition, is there any kind of, it might have to be pulled out of it, any kind of anthropological answer to this question? Or is it, in fact, an illegitimate question that I need to have Wittgensteinian therapy about? In the Christian tradition, Catholic particularly, Aquinas would be a helpful conversation partner. He describes the natural law as the participation of the human intellect in the eternal law, which ultimately for Aquinas is the equivalent of the divine mind, the logos. So everyone, every human being is equipped in some sense to interpret the moral law, which is binding on all people. At the same time, one's ability to interpret the more technical precepts of the natural law is, and to apply them to contingent singulars with prudence, is essentially enhanced by grace, which removes the impediments of sin and enables a higher form of communication with God. What's grace? Good question. We use the word a lot, but nobody's too clear. But in Aquinas, it's clear that grace is in fact a type of divinization. He writes, now the gift of grace surpasses every capacity or capability of created nature. 
since it is nothing short of a partaking of the divine nature, which exceeds every other nature. And thus it is impossible that any creature should cause grace. For it is as necessary that God alone should deify, bestowing a partaking of divine nature by our participated likeness, as it is impossible that anything save fire should rekindle or enkindle. So grace, in an atomistic framework, human beings are anchored in God at both ends. We participate in God but through the natural law and, and, and that participation in the eternal law. And you, to the extent you get grace, you're participating in some sense in God's own self-nature. Aquinas says the end of this is friendship with God. So it's not that you become God, you become a rival to God, you become capable, because like is alike, to be friends with God. If that's the case, what's the difference between that and this very striking phrase from Chaim? It seems to me it's much the same thing. To the Talmud, ultimate perfection is God and the angels arguing over the intricacies in Halakha. If if what you are doing is arguing in conversation with God, if you are fitted to befriend God in that way, is there some approaching of that notion of what Halakha makes possible and what Christians understand by grace as a form of friendship with God? Or is that just going too far? Is there no translation possibility? The final section of the syllabus on a comparative theology of law course I'd like to see is a section called Law's Reason and Law's Command. There is a tension in the Western tradition about the degree to which law has to be reasonable given its goals of governing the community in order to fully qualify as law or whether it is sufficient to be the valid command of the sovereign. You can see this in legal philosophy. Now, interesting, because he always does this, Aquinas' answer to this is sort of both. He defines law as an ordinance of reason for the common good made by him who has care of the community and promulgated. So it's both for Aquinas. It's an ordinance, ordo, command, and it's an ordinance of reason. It's got to be rational. Ambiguity over definitions of law, I think, has resulted in very defi different definitions among Christian theologians about what counts as legalism. Bad. We all know legalism is bad. It's, it's like it's, it's, it's really harshing somebody. But what is it? Interestingly enough, Germain Grise, a Catholic thinker, thinks it's too much emphasis on God's command and will without paying enough attention to the intellectual side of it, the order. And an Eastern Orthodox theologian, uh, Tris Engelhardt, says it's too much emphasis on reason without paying enough attention to God's command. <coughs> so grappling with the relationship between law as reason and law as command, I think, is, is, is another or essential part of a, of a, of a comparative theology content, uh, course. Within the Christian tradition, this issue would prompt consideration of more Protestant strands of Christian thought, particularly divine command theory. There are points at which I suspect the Jewish idea of law might have more in common, say, with the writings of Karl Barth, the great 20th century Protestant divine command theorist, than with some elements of, of Catholic thought. In fact, Karl Barth maintained that the real problem with Catholic moral thought was the metaphysical anthropological superstructure. You've got all of this understanding about how human beings grasp law, how we participate in the mind of God through, um, through our natural capacities and our participation in the eternal law. Well, then you're not going to experience a command as a command. You're going to experience it as an inclination. You're going to experience it as something you think came up with as yourself. But you're not going to experience it as a command. And Bart thinks that's bad. So that's a real challenge. But at the same time, Bart has to fight off challenges regarding the potential arbitrariness of God's command, on the one hand, or a sense that there is an intuitionist response to it on the other. How does he do it? 
Well, he shows by, he does this by showing how the command of God coheres with the manifest everyday worlds in several ways. First, the command has to be interpreted as part of the history of the relationship with Christ and the church, including all of salvation history in scripture, including the Hebrew Bible. Second, he commands attention to the givens of daily life. Vocation is the place of ordinary, everyday activity. God is commanding you where God finds you, to some degree, family, military, wherever you are. And practical casuistry is, in fact, how one often discerns God's command. So questions for, for Haim that these question, reflections prompt are just two, and I've got one minute left. How does Halakha balance law as reason and law as command and will? I understand there is no, you know, there's an opposition to the Greek notion of reason as universal, but there's still reasoning. There's still thought about it. We, you still use the human capacity to discern and understand to interpret that. Is there a reflection on the theoretical tension? And second, if I am correct in seeing halakha as more like Bart in emphasizing God's command versus God's rational plan, can I ask whether it is possible to say anything more general about how what you might call common sense rational elements, the givenness of life, affect the interpretation of those commands? So thank you again for a fascinating read and, um, and an opportunity to learn from you and from all of you here today. So in part, Chaim's book uh, is shaped by two Christian polemics against Jewish law. The first is the criticism of the Pharisees leveled by Jesus in the Gospels. According to Jesus, they, the Pharisees, focus on legal minutia to, at the expense of the weightier matters of the law. This is the accusation that Jewish law exalts form over substance, missing the deeper meaning of God's commands. The second criticism is, is intellectual rather than moral. Um, it's, it actually cannot be found in the New Testament. And this is the claim that Jewish law is philosophically and, theo and theologically sterile. The Christian cr tradition, so goes the criticism, has produced subtle theo philosophical and theological reflections, while the Talmud can offer nothing but the arid logic chopping of legal analysis. Now, there's no doubt more than a little anti-Semitism in both of these criticisms, but they have sufficient plausibility that Chaim feels <coughs> called upon to respond to both arguments. And in so, so doing, he implicitly compares Jewish law and Christian thought, pointing towards possible parallels between them. In the response to the first criticism, the book quite rightly notes that the concerns of Jesus with the weightier matters of the law are present in the Mishnah and the Talmud themselves. And thus, far from ignoring the danger of exalting form over substance, this danger is a persistent matter of discussion. The chief difference between the Gospels and the rabbis is the idiom in which the concerns are expressed. As Chaim points out, within the halakhic tradition, legal analysis becomes the genre in which a morally sensitive understanding of divine law emerges. The book's response to the second line of Christian attack builds on the insight about genre. Chaim shows that legal analysis is not the arid conceptual wasteland of the Christian polemic. Rather, deep questions of theology and ethics are dealt with in the halakhic discussion. The difference between the halakha and the Christian tradition of philosophical theology is again a matter of genre, where a Christian thinker like Thomas Aquinas articulates his thought theology using the language of Aristotelian philosophy. The rabbis get at many of the same questions indirectly by asking specific questions about technical legal rules. As the book ably illustrates the seemingly arbitrary outcomes in these legal arguments emerge from important substantive judgments on various theological issues. <laughs> Thus, according to Chaim, the halakha provides not only the kind of morally serious engagement with God's law called for by Jesus, but also a medium through which the rabbis can do the work reserved for philosophers and theologians within the Christian tradition. Now, there's a lot to admire in this defense, and I have no reason to object to the book's claims that legal analysis is a genre through which we can grasp and address transcendent questions. I'm a scholar of the common law, and for me, Chaim is preaching to the choir. Indeed, as a Christian of sorts, it could be disputed, I confess to more than a little holy envy at the devotional study of contract law. 
That sounds like my kind of Sunday school class. Um, Likewise, Jesus' attack on the Pharisees represents an important rebuke to a kind of hypocrisy to which all religious believers can be prone. Um, With Chaim, however, I reject uh, the claim that it's a peculiarly Jewish vice or one to which the halakha necessarily leads. That said, in his response to these criticisms, Chaim sets up a strong parallel between legal analysis and philosophical or theological reflection. One might read him as saying that the study of the Talmud and the Torah is what Jews do in place of theology. I want to suggest that this analogy is only partial. In 70 CE, Roman legions under the command of uh, the future emperor Titus stormed Jerusalem and set fire to the second temple. The destruction of the temple was a catastrophic event for ancient Judaism. The Mishnah and the Talmud are at least in part, it seems, an effort at retrenchment and preservation uh, for a post-temple Judaism. One of the fascinating aspects of Chaim's book is its account of the continuing vitality of the study of the legal rules governing the service of this long destroyed temple. The book invites the reader to ask the question of what is going on with this study. The second temple was the last in a line of Jewish temples extending the biblical narrative back to the tabernacle that God commanded the children of Israel to construct according to his plan in the desert before Mount Sinai. The tabernacle, and by extension the temple, was to be the house of the Lord. Now the French architect Cabousier provided modernism's uh, sort of desiccated definition of a house as a machine for living in. (laughs) Um, The house that God ordered Israel to build, however, was saturated with meaning. The temple was a model of the universe, retelling in its structure the story of God's creation of cosmos from chaos. Its rituals cleansed the people from their sins, refounding their lives. Ultimately, within its holy of holies, the high priest came ritually into the presence of God on behalf of Israel. Marcia Eliade argues that, quote, Judaism inherited the ancient oriental conception of the temple as a copy of the celestial work of architecture. As a house of the gods, hence a holy place above all others, the temple continually re-sanctifies the world because it at once represents and contains it. In the last analysis, it is by virtue of the temple that the world is re-sanctified in every part. However impure it may have become, the world is continually purified by the sanctuary of sanctuaries, unquote. In short, the temple is the axis mundi, the point where heaven touched earth and from which the earth was redeemed from the meaningless chaos into which it would fall without God's act of creation. Seen in these terms, the destruction wrought by Titus's legionaries wasn't simply an act of vandalism or national humiliation. It destroyed the structure through which God and his world touched ours. Now, as described by Chaim, the Halakha performs many of the same spiritual functions, it seems to me, as the temple. The study of the law isn't simply a way in which one thinks about God or ethics or cosmology. Rather, it becomes a way of coming into the presence of God. Seen in these terms, the continued study of the laws governing the service of the temple makes good sense. The temple is transformed from a literal, physical structure into a legal, conceptual structure. And one can come within the Holy of Holies through the act of legal study rather than through the rituals of the tabernacle. As the Talmud puts it, from the day the temple was destroyed, God has had no portion in this world save the four cubits of Halakha. Now, how do Christians come into the presence of God? The answer I would submit is not by doing philosophy and theology. Uh, Consider Thomas Aquinas. A few months before his death, Aquinas was celebrating the mass when he had a religious experience that affected him profoundly. He told his secretary, quote, all that I have written appears to me as so much straw after the things which have been revealed to me, unquote. Now, one cannot imagine the brisker scholars described by Chaim coming to a similar conclusion with their studies of the Halakha. Uh, One suspects that even maybe a partisan of Hasidism um, might criticize the briskers for emphasizing the legal at the expense of direct mystical experience, but even them, they, I suspect, are going to balk at calling the Mishnah and the Talmud straw. Even for a devout and Thomistic Catholic, however, the Summa is not the Talmud, And while Aquinas' statement is perhaps striking or shocking, it does not represent a rupture with the fundamental structure of Christian spirituality. It has been said that the proper analogy for the Quran is not the Christian Bible, but rather Jesus Christ. This is because the Quran, as a direct emanation of the divine mind in some sense, represents a kind of incarnation of God's presence in the world. Likewise, for a Christian in Jesus, 
the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Now, the corpus of the halakha is far too mediated by human debate and analysis to be incarnational. It's not the Quran, and it is not the word made flesh. Its study, however, does provide a kind of primal, almost ritual entrance into the presence of God. Before his crucifixion, Jesus held a Passover feast with his disciples. There he declared that the broken bread was his body and the wine was to be drunk in remembrance of his blood. With a few exceptions, the ritual recapitulation of this meal has been at the center of Christian worship from that time to the present. Catholicism, with its doctrine of transubstantiation, provides perhaps our most striking statement um, of this. For a Catholic, the host and the wine literally become the flesh and body blood of God incarnate. In the words of the Catechism, the Eucharist is the efficacious sign and sublime cause of that communion, the divine life, and that unity of the people of God by which the church is kept in being. It is the culmination both of God's action, sanctifying the world in Christ, and the worship men offer to Christ and through him to the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now to me, this sounds like the entrance into the Holy of Holies, the direct experience of God's presence that gives meaning to the world and holds together the people of God. Now, to be sure, Judaism has its own liturgy. Um, and you might object that the proper analogy for the Christian ritual of the Lord's Supper within Judaism is not the study of law, but rather the <coughs> rituals of the Sabbath day or the Day of Atonement or Passover or the other rituals of Jewish life. Um, this is a fair point. No analogy is going to be perfect. However, if the halakhic authorities are to be believed, the current ritual, ritual life of Judaism is incomplete. For its ritual completion, Jewish law requires the temple. There is thus a sense in which it is only within the legal categories of the halakha that the complete life of Judaism is possible after Titus's sack of Jerusalem. It is only in the study of the halakha and the process of legal analysis and, dis and dispute that brings one fully into the temple, into the axis mundi of creation. For a Christian, however, this happens when one comes into the presence, literal or figurative, depending on your sacramental theology, of the blood and body of Jesus, the incarnate Son of God. So what can we learn about the idea of law more generally from the halakhic insight that we can come into the presence of God through the study of, of his law? This is, of course, something like the question that Robert Cover purported to answer in his famous essay, Nomos and Narrative. For Cover, the attraction of the halakhic tradition was what he saw as its openness to a never-ending process of interpretive play and meaning-making, what he called juris genesis. The result was the normative world that we inhabit, inhabit and which gives meaning to our social arrangements, what Cover called nomos. Now, Cover lacked the deep expertise in Jewish law that Chaim commands. But given the story that Chaim tells about the role of argument over non-applied law in the Halakha, there's a kind of plausibility to Cover's reading of the tradition. For Cover, bad law um, is law that tries to foreclose interpretation and impose a correct answer based on authority. This was what he called juris pathetic law, in contrast to the more hopeful process of juris genesis. And he aphoristically insisted, we ought to stop circumscribing the nomos. We ought to invite new worlds. Um, now, not surprisingly, for cover and his acoly acolytes, lionize the exchange in the Babylonian Talmud over the oven of Achnai, in which God himself seems to disclaim authority over his law. In Cover's imagination, Jewish law becomes a kind of postmodern hermeneutic utopia in which the never-ending play of interpretation finally escapes the heavy and coercive hand of authority. It seems to me that Cover misses something important about Jewish law, namely the role that authority plays in its meaning-making power. Furthermore, in the meaning-making project, claims to authority are a feature and not a bug. Law claim Law makes claims that in Joseph Raz's formulation purport to exclude other reasons for action. Contra covers, covers image of Juris Genesis, lawyers are more often than not engaged in a kind of practical reasoning. We're trying to figure out what we ought to do. Um, um, however, the reasoning of lawyers is always limited by the demands of the law. There are certain things that one ought to do, and there are certain things that one ought not to do. Why? Because the law says so. What if, there are, what if the lawyers own all things considered judgments are different? 
The answer, it doesn't matter for a lawyer. The law simply relate, replaces a lawyer's all things considered judgments with its authority. This is what makes legal reasoning different from other forms of practical reasoning. Now, traditionally, lawyers who have thought about legal authority have assumed, naturally enough, that the most important question one can ask about that authority is whether or not it's justified. So the law claims authority. It doesn't follow from the fact the law claims authority, that it actually um, should be granted that authority. Um, I want to point out, though, that claims to authority do more than simply demand justification. They also orient us toward something beyond ourselves. To engage in practical reasoning in the presence of authority is to be constantly aware that there is something greater than yourself that demands abnegation on your part of some kind. Now, this, of course, is the stance of a faithful believer before God. It does make sense that the experience of legal analysis lends itself to the experience of religious worship. For Christians, this experience of being in the presence of the transcendent comes through the ritual presence of the incarnation of God in Christ. For the student of the halakha, I suspect, um, obviously can't speak with any authority, but I suspect it comes through the experience of the law's authority rather than through the endless process of interpretation valorized by cover. The spiritual attraction of the endless interpretive arguments is precisely that they continually throw the interlocutors against the claims of the law's authority, against the transcendent. Which returns us to the temple. The temple provides a point of contact between heaven and earth, the place where God might dwell among us. In that sense, it was something that came from beyond our world, from outside, from heaven. Yet ironically, perhaps, it was this alien invasion that makes our world comprehensible. Before the interruption of God from the outside, says Genesis 1.1, earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In Eliade's words, we could say that the experience of sacred space makes possible the founding of the world, where the sacred manifests itself in space, the real unveils itself, and the world comes into existence. But the interruption of the sacred not only projects a fixed point in the formless fluidity of profane space, a center into chaos, it also affects a break in plane. That is, it opens communication between the cosmic planes, between earth and heaven, and makes possible ontological passage from one mode of being to another. And in such a break in the heterogeneity of profane space that creates the center through which communication with the transcendent is established, and that consequently founds the world. For the center renders orientation possible. Now, law provides a kind of sacred space, I think, for secular societies. It guides and controls actions. It coerces. It might be justified or not justified. But it does more than this. It maintains the constant experience of something pressing in on us from beyond, a claim to authority that displaces our individual judgments. It creates order, a nomos in covers terms, but not because it opens up a place for our constant self-creation, although it might do this for some lawyers, right? Um, rather, in claiming authority, law points us back to the experience of transcendence. And that ex we seem to have a hunger for that experience that can't be satiated, even when we vociferously insist that our laws are not Torah and do not come from God. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. We uh, got started a, a little bit late, so maybe we'll go for 10, 10 minutes if, if, we, uh, if we could. Um, so I'll open the floor for questions. Yeah. Um, so this question is probably best for Professor Kaplan in Oman, and probably Dean Moody is another professor of law. But early on in Professor Salmon's book, he starts with a discussion as to whether Jesus was right about his review um, of the Pharisees with their obsession with the particular. But from the law student's perspective, right from the get-go, we're instructed that there's a tremendous value in the particular, and that our legal analysis should be as precise as possible. So my question is, if Jesus was a law student today, would he offer a <coughs> sort of review of our legal education? <laughs> but that's a really interesting question. Um, I, 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 oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I should. I should get my law professor voice back and speak to you without the mic. Um, I, 
I think how you interpret what Jesus says um, in his attitude toward the law really needs, you know, some critique. Um, there's a whole tradition of, of, you know, you know, Paul was a lot of the tradition uh -huh. read Paul through, you know, Paul and the Jews as sort of the Protestant Catholic fight, you know, anti-legalism versus legalism, and that's not actually. I think the right way, you know, to read Paul or Jesus's comments on this. Um, you know, there's some really interesting stuff done by Christian um, biblical scholars. Marcus Botmuel from, I think he's at Cambridge now, wrote a book called uh, uh, Jewish Law and Gentile Churches, which I think gives a more nuanced and more appreciative understanding of how um, how uh, Jesus related to the law. And, and the bottom line of it, I think, is not an opposition to law itself or to the Jewish legal tradition. It's opposition to the misuse of a legal tradition to deny the humanity of somebody before it. And that is something that takes place certainly it took place in Jewish communities. It takes place in Christian communities today and in Muslim communities and in secular communities. It's about how law can be twisted to deny humanity and pervert justice rather than to honor humanity and serve justice. And that's, I think, a reinterpretation of what that is, I think, really needs to be, you know, to be part of the Christian dialogue with um, with Judaism because it's, it's wrongful anti-Semitism, anti-Judaic, and it's just wrong about what Jesus wanted. And it's wrong about the role of law in the Christian church. You know, Catholic tradition has a tremendously wonderful tradition of casuistry. And, 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 and when I see the excitement of, of, of the Holocaust and the, and the Talmud, you know, going into the details, there's real analogy to the, you know, considerations in the casuistical tradition that that happened. The Protestant tradition also has that. You know, there's a whole Calvinist and Anglican tradition of dealing with particular cases. And, and I think that that's also important. I see the common law at its best as taking seriously the dialectic between rules and concrete cases. And what's best about the common law tradition is that the rule is never separated from the case. Yes, you have a rule. Yes, it's put into the, to the, um, you know, to the black letter, you know, the restatement or something. But what we teach you in law school is to read the case and to use the case to qualify, to modify, even to read against the rule if necessary. Rules and people, they have to be together. Right, so that we read Luther into Paul, and then we read Paul into the Gospels. And I think if you read the Gospels, it's not what Jesus is saying. Like if you read the Sermon on the Mount um, in Matthew, um, you know, Jesus goes out of his way to say like, I'm not going to get rid of like one jot or tittle of the law. I'm not getting any one um, quote or punctuation mark in the law is not going to be um, uh, uh, done away with. Um, but his, his, his objection, right, seems to be about hypocrisy or cruelty or something like that rather than legalism per se. I have to say, I would assume that Jesus would not be happy with modern American law schools or um, I, I assume that there would I think be. That would be his first problem. Um, <laughs> and ambition and things like that uh, that go on in law schools. Um, uh, a lot of um, um, ostentatious displays of various kind. Um, uh, but I suspect that's what he would object to, not studying law in law school. But Luther started out as an Augustinian friar. <laughs> but fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> other, uh, any other questions? Yes. Sandy Levinson. I wonder, what yeah, to you lawyers? Well, one to us. You, you know, lay people with you know, burdens. Is there a distinction between lawyers and the law? I mean, is there an implicit critique there of the social position of people who call themselves lawyers? They usually, not necessarily, usually serve the well off. And the incentive is to interpret the law, which you may you know, view as twisting or not in order to serve the interests of the clients. Um, so from that perspective, if one focuses on that particular passage of gospel, is it necessarily a 